my talk will be on pendulum motion, how the history and philosophy of science can contribute to education. The pendulum is not just a device of pure physics, it is fascinating because of its intriguing history and the range of its technical applications spanning many fields and several centuries. Quote, the principle behind the pendulum swing, a property called isochronism, marks a simple yet fundamental system in nature, one that ties the rhythm of time to the very existence of matter in the universe. This seems a very big claim, yet over the last now two decades, maybe three decades, the pendulum clock that's familiar to everyone, the grandfather clock, has in fact been replaced by quantum pendulum clocks. That at the quantum level, the isochronic motion of pendulums is still apparent matter. The pendulum had a very central role in early modern science. It established the laws of free fall through Galileo, established the conservation of energy laws through Newton, determined the value of the gravitational constant, G, Newton, enabled the speed of sound to be determined again by Newton, importantly established the unity of celestial mechanics and terrestrial mechanics. It unified the mechanics of the heavens with the mechanics and laws of the earth. Prior to this unification, of course, the whole Aristotelian conception was that the heavens were the heavens, the earth was something else, and there was no commonality between heavenly motions and earthly motions. They weren't bound by the same laws. With Newton's discovery of the acceleration or the rotation of the moon, uh, he unified both. It enabled accurate timekeeping. This was predominantly through Christian Huygens. It solved the pressing longitude problem, which allowed the European nations to accurately trade and navigate the world. It established an international unit of length, the meter, determined the speed of bullets and projectiles. The simple pendulum, which I have here, enabled the oblate shape of the earth to be determined. It proved that the Earth rotates, and above, beyond all of this, it ascertained the structure, density, and mass of the Earth. So all of these remarkable things were ascertained or discovered in virtue of simply what you see in front of you, a mass swinging at the end of a string. Very, very low tech and my claim in my different books is that in a science classroom, this very cheap, low-tech, low-cost piece of equipment can be used by classes to work their way through all of the discoveries that I have mentioned. Galileo's pendulum claims are things that are taught in most uh, beginning science certainly beginning physics classes, Galileo's four laws of the pendulum, period varies as the square root of length, the law of length, period is independent of amplitude, the law of amplitude, period is independent of weight, the law of weight independence, and finally, and most importantly, for a given length, all periods are the same. For any length of a pendulum, whether you take the pendulum out two degrees and let it swing, or whether you take it out 45 degrees and let it swing, the period, the length of time taken for a swing is the same. That's the law of isochrony. 
Galileo's patron, the great mathematician and engineer, Garibaldo del Monte, kept saying to Galileo that what you was, your claims about the pendulum are incorrect, that the pendulum does not behave the way you say that it does. Del Monte keeps saying, Galileo, you are a great mathematician, but you are a poor physicist. Galileo proved his pendulum laws by mathematics. Galileo replies saying pendulums would behave as mathematically proved if impediments, accidents, and imperfections were all removed. Galileo, in the beginning of the 17th century, makes the decisive step towards the mathematization of physics. He introduces idealizations into science. That science tells us not about the messy world that we see in front of us, but about an idealized world, a world free of friction, free of impediments, etc. Huygens saw, as did Galileo, that the pendulum could be used for timekeeping. Specifically, what Huygens was able to do was establish that it was the cycloid that gave a swinging object an isochronic uh, trajectory. If a body moved in a cycloidal curve, then it truly was isochronic. From a long way out to the other side, took a certain time. From a short way out to the other side, took the same time, not in a circle as Galileo thought, but in a cycloid. Once that was established, then Huygens created his famous pendulum clock. Uh, these are commonly seen in all books of physics and of timekeeping. The supposed, the, not the supposed, the aptly named grandfather clock. What Huygens proposed was that the length of a second's pendulum could be the international standard of length. This, of course, was a remarkable contribution both to science, the science of measurement, and to everyday and social life. Each state, each country, each nation, down to the level of cities, had their own units of measurement. It's easy to imagine, in retrospect, the impact on military weapons, on trade, on construction, boat building, commerce, and of course, the impact of this chaotic system of measurement on science. How do natural philosophers from one country to another, one city to another, communicate their, re their results, their measurements, if every scientist is operating in a system that has different units from the person they're communicating with. Huygens' basic unit of length was the second's pendulum, which happens to be 0 0.9935 of the modern meter. The second's pendulum, to use it as a universal standard of length, something that swung in seconds no matter where on the earth it was, whether it was in France, in Egypt, in China, in Australia, assumed a spherical earth. And Huygens recognized this. Jean Ricoeur, in his 1673 voyage to Cain, Cain is the top of Latin uh, South America, a French colony at the time, the site of Devil's Island. Jean Ricoeur took Huygens' pendulum clock to Cayenne, and he found that the clock 
had to be shortened in order to beat seconds. This, of course, was a major issue for Huygens and for natural uh, philosophers at the time. Why did the clock have to be shortened? It beat slower at Cayenne on the equator than it did in Paris. It had to be shortened not much, roughly three millimeter. Three millimeter is the thickness of a match. Not much, but nevertheless three millimeter. This opens up interesting methodological or philosophical considerations that were gone through at the time and that can be gone through with classes. You have a theory T that the earth is spherical. You have conditions along with your theory. It implies an observation, O, namely that the period of a clock in Paris, pendulum clock, will be the same as the period of the clock in Cayenne in the tropics. But it turned out that O was not the case. You had falsification. T plus C implied O. O was not the case. The combination of T and C were falsified. Well, of course, the easiest thing is to say that your conditions that accompanied the theory were not correct. The first condition, that the experimenter is a good experimenter. People held on to the theory, a circular earth, and said, well, Ricoeur was a poor experimenter. He did not know how to set up the clock. That saved the theory. But Flamsted and other very prominent astronomers and scientists found the same in the tropics. The second way of preserving your theory of the spherical earth was to say the tropics are hot. In the tropics, the pendulum itself lengthened. When you heat chains or when you heat rods or when you heat wires, they get longer. Therefore, the pendulum had got longer in the tropics. So in effect, it was longer than a meter. You had to shorten it. But people made adjustments for the heat. And still, even when ice was taken and they had it swinging in cold temperature in the tropics, it had to be shortened. Humidity. Oh, the tropics are really humid and it's the humid air that the pendulum is pushing against and it's the humid air that's slowing it down and therefore it has to be shortened. Well, all of these things preserved your theory. The earth is spherical. Finally, well, in the tropics, everything rusts. Things weather, wear out, rust more easily in the tropics than anywhere else. Mildew, mold, and the mechanisms of the clock were affected by weathering in the tropics. Well, each of these four conditions preserved your theory, a spherical earth. But progressively, each one was tested, 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 and it was found that the conditions did not save the theory. Each of the conditions could be rectified. The next step in saving the theory was centrifugal force. When things spin around, they get thrown off a spinning uh, sphere or a spinning base. At the North Pole, nothing gets thrown off. The Earth spins, you stand at the North Pole and you don't spin off. The further you come down the surface of the globe, Paris, you are spinning off more. At the equator, centrifugal force is greatest. That's where the greatest angular momentum is, the greatest velocity of spin, 
So the more you spin off. What Huygens showed was that the centrifugal force did not explain all of the uh, slowing of the pendulum. He said that the only explanation was that the Earth had an oblate shape, not a spherical shape. Famously, Voltaire said this example showed that natural philosophers or scientists were prepared to give up their theory when experimental evidence stacked up against it. And Voltaire compared this with both religious people, with politicians, and with ideologues who simply never gave up their theory despite all the evidence against it. We can use the pendulum to do, both in a science class and outside of a science class, is to show that science has a great impact on culture and that culture and technology has an impact on science. Thank you so very much for your attention. Se você gostou desse vídeo, dê um like, compartilhe. Aproveite para assinar o canal e ative as notificações.